Today, we're privileged to have with us one of the most impactful leaders in higher education over the past four decades. Someone who has changed the landscape of higher education in our nation, Dr. Diana Natalicio, the president of the University of Texas at El Paso. Under her leadership, UTEP has provided a model for expanding the communities that have access to higher education while providing a deep context for research and teaching. Joining UTEP in 1971 as a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Modern Languages, she has since become one of the, most, one of the longest serving presidents in our nation. She was selected as president in 1988, and she has transformed the University of Texas at El Paso. She's increased the number of students from 15,000 to over 25,000, while also increasing significantly the percentage of students who come from the Paso del Norte area, a region historically underserved by higher education. Today, 80% of the students at UTEP are Hispanic, and 55% are the first in their families to attend college. She's also dramatically impacted the research agenda of the school. In 1988, UTEP had one doctoral degree program. Now they have 22, and their research expenditures have grown from 6 million to over 90 million, creating, as Diana has described, quote, the only doctoral research university in the United States that serves a predominantly Mexican-American student population, close quote. Her work to deepen the context for formation and inquiry at UTEP has also provided a framework for the university to play a role in the social and economic development of its local community, from fostering community partnerships to help raise the aspirations and educational attainment of all young people, to encouraging regional business development, to educating a population of young people for the local workforce, with 60% of UTEP graduates choosing to stay and serve in their home community. This deep commitment to access and to the role of the university in serving the common good has made her a leading voice in the national conversation on higher education. She served on the Advisory Commission on Educational Excellence for Hispanic Americans and on the National Science Board She's a principal investigator in the National Science Foundation program to increase participation in STEM fields. And she served in 2013 as chair of the board of directors of the American Council on Education. In 2011, she was presented with the Order of the Aztec Eagle by the president of Mexico, the highest recognition bestowed to an individual who is not from Mexico for her extraordinary public service. That same year, 2011, we were privileged to have her here as a commencement speaker for our School of Continuing Study and to recognize her with an honorary degree. In 2017, she was named one of Fortune Magazine's top 50 world leaders and was included on the 2016 Time 100 list of most influential people in the world. In 2015, the Carnegie Corporation of New York honored her with its Academic Leadership Award in recognition of her exceptional efforts to transform UTEP into a national public research university. The world of higher education has changed dramatically over these, these past three decades, and we of the Academy have had the great privilege and honor of being witnesses to her visionary leadership over the course of these years. Diana, we are honored to welcome you back to the Hilltop and to have you here today to offer your reflections. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce to you President Diana Natalicio. Thank you all 
so very much, and thank you for that more than generous introduction. I think there's very little left for me to say, but I will try to think of something. I'd also like to offer my congratulations to all of the honorees today, what impressive individuals you are, and so well deserving of the honors that you've received. My congratulations. I'm so pleased to be with all of you this afternoon, and I thank you sincerely for this opportunity to share a few perspectives from my vantage point on the U.S.-Mexico border. I live and work very happily in a place called El Paso, Texas, which is a city of 800,000 mostly Mexican-American people, which together with its sister city across the border, Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, whose population exceeds one and a half million, forms a vibrant, binational, metropolitan area of nearly three million residents. From its origins more than four centuries ago and located equidistant between the Pacific Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico, along what is now the 2,000 mile U.S.-Mexico border, our region has always served as a major migration and trade corridor through the Sierra Madre and Rocky Mountains. El Paso del Norte is literally the pass of the North. The university I've been privileged to serve as president for the past nearly 30 years was established more than 100 years ago as the Texas School of Mines and Metallurgy to prepare mining engineers for the copper, lead, and zinc mines in both northern Mexico and southern New Mexico and Arizona. At 4,000 feet in elevation and more than 600 miles and a time zone away from our state capital in Austin, we've developed a unique and some might even say iconoclastic institutional personality. Most of us who live in El Paso also find it difficult to understand, much less accept, the ground zero or war zone characterization of our border region in the current national narrative. The growing reinforcement of the border physical infrastructure, including the border fence, which already exists, or the wall, which is threatened, now serves as a real, highly symbolic and painful daily reminder of that deep discord. It wasn't always like this. When I arrived more than 40 years ago as a new faculty member in linguistics at the University of Texas at El Paso, I marveled at being able to live in two countries at the same time. I regularly crossed back and forth between El Paso and Juarez to eat, to shop, to visit friends and attend cultural events, sometimes more than once a day. <coughs> Longtime residents of our region, including a large number of today's UTEP students, staff, and faculty, have close extended families whose members reside on both sides of the international boundary and with whom they maintain very close contact. There's a special energy about the confluence of people and cultures in a border region. Scientists tell us that the most interesting work occur occurs at the interfaces. The mostly first and second generation immigrant population in El Paso is high aspiring, plucky, and industrious. They believe strongly in the American dream, and most of them have had to fight very hard to gain access to it. The demographics of UTEP's 25,000 students mirror those of the surrounding El Paso County, from which 84% of them come. 80% are Mexican American, and another 5% are Mexican nationals, a majority of whom commute to our campus daily across the International Bridge and through Customs and Border Protection every day. More than half of all these 25,000 students are the first in their families to attend college, and most of their families have extremely modest financial means. 40% of our students report an annual family income of $20,000 or less. Student demographics have changed significantly since the 1980s, when UTEP was a majority Anglo university in a majority Hispanic community. If you assume, as we do, that talent crosses all boundaries, gender, ethnicity and race, geography and socioeconomic level, 
it was easy to see that far too much talent in the Hispanic community was being squandered for lack of opportunities to develop it. So one of my primary goals on becoming UTEP's president was to align the university's demographics with those of the surrounding region. We should look like El Paso. This was not at all an easy task. We had to challenge stereotypes as well as widely accepted traditional higher education measures of prestige and exclusivity. We began by studying feeder patterns into UTEP from area high schools, which high schools were not sending us many, or in some cases, any of their graduates. Not surprisingly, all of the under-delivering high schools were located in the most Hispanic and lowest income zip codes. Principals and teachers often described their students as not college material. And many parents and even the students themselves sometimes agreed with that assessment. There was a severe collective underestimation of the potential of low-income Hispanics to perform academically and an unexpectedly strong conviction that raising young people's expectations would only lead to their disappointment and dysfunction. We were warned by many prosperous community leaders, both Anglo and a few Hispanic, that we would have to lower standards if we admitted those students and we would surely ruin our reputation. I should probably interject here that upon arriving in El Paso, I had noticed bumper stickers that referred to Harvard on the border, a slogan that always struck me as more sad than self-deprecatingly funny. If that was indeed our reputation, I considered it quite ready for ruin. We next studied admissions requirements, including standardized test scores, and learned that although a very high SAT or ACT might successfully predict academic success at UTEP, a low score didn't predict much of anything, except that standardized test score performance was highly correlated with test preparation courses and tutoring to which most low-income students didn't have access. So our focus then shifted to class rank in high school, which turned out to be a slightly more reliable predictor of performance at UTEP, but not perfect. But since our quest was to ensure that not a single talented and motivated young person would be denied an opportunity, we also decided to create a provisional first semester program which permitted any high school graduates who did not meet our already very relaxed admissions requirements to enroll for one semester, one semester only, under very strict guidance, so as to demonstrate their capacity and their determination to succeed. I should mention here that we did a recent post-graduation survey of a group of these so-called provisionally admitted students. And what we discovered was that they include a project engineer at Apple, an explosives technologist specialist at NASA, and a microbiologist at the US Geological Survey. There's no doubt in my mind that as the only Texas public university within 300 miles, we did exactly the right thing in giving those young people a chance to prove themselves. All of this work in the late 1980s was data-driven. We were developing our own very robust set of regional performance metrics and engaging in highly customized data analysis. The next step was to utilize those data to strengthen the highly in interdependent educational ecosystem in our region. More than 80% of our students are graduates of area high schools, and 75% of the teachers in those high schools earned one or more degrees at UTEP. We're a very isolated region. This closed loop offered us exciting opportunities for innovative collaboration strategic data sharing, and reciprocal accountability. In 1992, we established the El Paso Collaborative for Academic Excellence, which was a systemic reform partnership that included UTEP, all 12 school districts in our county, the El Paso Community College, and regional business and civic leaders, whose primary goal was to ensure a smooth pre-K through 16 pathway for all young people in our region. 
We celebrated the collaborative's 25th anniversary this year, and this partnership has gained national recognition for its innovation, its success, and sustainability. The outcomes of this systemic reform initiative have been extraordinary. Our historically underserved and low-resourced El Paso region has become one of the top Texas performers in increasing student success at all levels, especially for low-resource students. The collaborative's work and the growing trust it has fostered among educational institutions in the region have already changed the life prospects for a fast-growing number of talented young people and their families. Since 2000, UTEP's enrollment has grown by more than 50%, and degrees awarded annually have more than doubled to 4,500 per year. Now, you may be beginning to wonder why I'm describing all of this to you, the region I live in, the people whose lives have touched mine, as well as the university that's been my passion for the past nearly 50 years. Well, it's that very passion that has led me on a quest to share with educated and thoughtful leaders, like all of you, a story about a region of this country that I don't think is being fairly told. In fact, my greatest concern now, and growing concern, is the growing misrepresentation and even denigration of the high aspiring and successful Hispanic population along the historically underserved U.S.-Mexico border, and especially its young people. I earnestly hope that each of you will help me spread the word that there's another narrative. But there's another very compelling reason why I want to share this story with you. The low-resourced Hispanic population with, with, with which we work at UTEP is not merely a border phenomenon. Demogra demographers tell us that Latinos have been and continue to be the fastest growing segment of the U.S. population, and they live and work just about everywhere across the country today. Wherever they are, they deserve opportunities such as those that we're trying to create at UTEP, and it's all of our, in all of our interests to become advocates for such opportunity generation. And the story isn't really limited to Latinos either. There are talented and low-resourced young people across this country from a wide range of ethnicities, races, and national origins who also deserve opportunities to access the one most likely pathway to life success, which is, of course, a high-quality post-secondary education. I have deep feelings about this because although it was a very long time ago, I was once one of those students, and my guess is that many of you were too. I grew up in St. Louis and attended a blue-collar public high school whose mission was to prepare its male graduates for the workforce, primarily for union apprenticeships as plumbers, electricians, and carpenters at such major industries as Anheuser-Busch and Monsanto. The girls were expected to marry those boys, and most of us studied typing and shorthand just in case we needed to work before those happy nuptials. No one talked with us about attending college, much less about scholarships or other enabling strategies. So like nearly all of my fellow high school graduates, I went to work. I was a 17-year-old switchboard operator at a large industrial company, the Lily Tomlin of Nordberg Manufacturing. <laughs> After a month of switchboard mastery, I was utterly bored and truly frightened by what appeared to be my dreadful future. I somehow mustered the courage to go to St. Louis University, there were no public universities in St. Louis at that time, to ask about enrolling. I learned that I would qualify for admission, but that I'd probably have to study very hard to catch up with fellow students who were slew high school graduates. And supposedly they claimed they'd read Dante. Now I didn't know who Dante was, and I learned later that some of those claims were exaggerated. <laughs> those billikins. I assured Slu and convinced myself that my family had taught me to be a hard worker, though I confess that I lived in fear of failure throughout my freshman year 
and perhaps even longer. And I see that same fear in the eyes of so many of the students who come to UTEP with their big dreams. The other major challenge that I faced was how to finance my education, primarily St. Louis University's tuition, which at the time was, hold on to your seats, $375 per semester. With SLU's help, I found a half-time secretarial job at a small construction company near the campus, and with that and a tutoring job on Saturdays, I actually got to, to tutor Stan Musial's daughter. Think about that. Since I'm a big baseball fan, that was very cool. Almost forgot the Spanish that I was supposed to tutor. Um, so with that, those two jobs, I was able to fully cover my investment in tuition books and transportation. Like many UTEP students, I lived at home. Although there are parallels between UTEP students and my own shaky start at SLU 50 plus years ago, the higher education landscape has obviously changed dramatically. With a half-time job, I could fund the full costs of my high-quality education. Half-time job. That isn't possible today, even at a relatively low-cost public university like UTEP, with tuition at $3,700 per semester. When earlier this year I was honored to be invited to speak at SLU's commencement, the thrill of returning to the launch pad that propelled me through a life that's been filled with so many rich opportunities was incredibly moving for me. But I also have to confess that my joy was tempered by the realization that what SLU did for me and many other blue collar students like me 50 years ago, they really can't do today. Higher education costs have escalated in both private and public sectors and financial aid doesn't come close to covering those costs. Data on the growing disparity over the past 50 years in the United States baccalaureate degree attainment between students in the lowest and highest socioeconomic quartiles are extremely sobering. In the 1970s, 6.6% .6 of young people in the lowest socioeconomic quartile completed bachelor's degrees, compared with over 36% in the highest quartile. 40 years later, in 2010, the lowest quartile bachelor's degree attainment rate had risen by only 2% to 8.8%, while the highest quartile had doubled to more than 70%. The growing disparity should be a cause for alarm for every single one of us. And the future doesn't seem terribly rosy. Appropriations for education in the public sector have declined in most states, including my own, and tuition and fee costs and student debt rise in response. The challenges we face in attempting to execute UTEP's access and excellence mission grow more, more daunting by the day, and the policy context at both federal and state levels is increasingly ominous. So whenever possible, I commit to sharing UTEP's social justice model and advocating across the country for strategies to increase educational opportunities for talented young people of modest financial means through such initiatives and as enhanced financial aid and scholarships and work study, exchange programs, dual credit, and early college high school. Although we certainly seek to achieve social justice, we know too that this nation's global competitiveness is also at stake. It will depend on our success in developing these young people's abundant talent starting with assuring them access to a quality higher education. I'm often asked why I chose to stay at UTEP rather than to move to a larger or more prestigious university. By now, that should be as obvious to you as it is to me. I'm passionate about being able to pay back systematically and at scale through my work at UTEP the incredible opportunity that the Jesuits at St. Louis University offered me, a high quality education at an affordable cost. UTEP is a place where the impact of such payback is palpable every single day, not only on such special occasions as award ceremonies and graduations. 
What's been especially exciting for me, too, is that so many of UTEP's most accomplished faculty and staff share this same passion to pay back for their own opportunities through their work with UTEP students. I can't think of an accomplishment that has given my UTEP colleagues and me greater satisfaction than a recent Brookings study which ranked UTEP number one among all U.S. research universities in fostering student social mobility. Why is that so satisfying? Because unlike U.S. News and World Report, whose wealth and prestige-driven measures are poorly aligned with UTEP and the students that we serve, this Brookings study attempted to capture exactly what we have dedicated ourselves to deliver for UTEP students over the past 30 years, social mobility through quality higher education. By challenging traditional policies, procedures, and metrics, UTEP has been successful in creating amazing opportunities for large numbers of students who at another place or time might not have had access to them. Although Georgetown and UTEP are worlds apart in some ways on the higher education landscape, I know from working with President DeJoya and others here today that many of you share this passion. We know we are privileged to work with talented and high aspiring young people whose bright futures we are helping to shape. For them, we must be optimists, despite the extremely competitive and often discouraging higher education climate. There's too much at stake, too much important work to be done to ensure that we leave this world a better and more equitable place for them than it is for so many young people in the US today. Educators play an especially essential role in ensuring that this critically important work gets done and all of us have been entrusted with this major responsibility. I thank each and every one of you for all you have done and will continue to do, and I thank you very much for this opportunity to be with you today. Thank you.